Hi! Space genetic techniques provide us great opportunities to monitor changes on, under and even above the surface of the Earth. As we discussed in the last lecture, VLPI help to confirm seafloor spreading and continental drift. In general, GNSS, VLPI, SLR, and Doris and other techniques are used to identify and monitor tectonic plate motions on various scales. But before we look at those phenomena, we need to change the viewpoint, look at the Earth from outer space and see how the Earth behaves on a much larger scale. Space genetic techniques make use of natural or artificial objects in space, which allow us to look at how our planet spins beneath it. But the Earth isn't the perfect spherical shape, and there are gravity forces from the Sun, Moon and other planets that make the Earth's axis to rotate just like a spinning top. This effect is called precision. It takes about 26,000 years until the rotation axis has completed one full cycle. But there are also other effects that change the rotational behavior of our planet. Let's start with this sketch and assume that the blue box represents mass on, inside or above the Earth's surface. If mass inside the Earth is re relocated or if shifted on the surface, this will cause the rotation of our planet to change slightly. This can be explained by conservation of angular momentum. Let's do a quick physics recap. The momentum P is the product of the mass and the velocity. In case of rotary motion, the velocity is the angular velocity omega times the distance to the rotation axis. Here it's represented by d. The angular momentum L is the distance d times the momentum P we get the expression m times omega times d squared. If there aren't any external forces acting on the system, L remains constant. It's conserved, if you like. So for example, if d would change as the result of some system internal event, then the angular velocity omega would need to change as well for the angular momentum to remain constant. Here's an example. Let's assume that ice from the northern polar cap melts into the oceans. Since the ice at the polar caps are closer to the rotation axis than most part of the water in the oceans, the distance increases. Since we assume this is an all internal system process, the angular momentum of the melted ice is conserved. This means the angular velocity decreases. This is one of several effects we can observe using space genetic techniques. It quite nicely demonstrates that we are able to monitor effects indirectly by studying how our planet is spinning. By the way, this is the same physical phenomena ice skaters use when they are controlling their spin by moving their arms closer away or away from their bodies. So if everything is spinning, the need for a reference becomes clear. Let's think of riding a carousel. Assume that it's totally dark outside and all you see is just the carousel itself. You will not be able to find out how fast you are spinning. Now let's assume that there is something outside that is not spinning. For example, friends standing next to the carousel. By just looking at your friends, you will be able to confirm that the carousel is actually spinning and by measuring the time it takes to see your friend again after one round even determine how fast your carousel rotates. We have very long baseline interferometry VLBI which relies on radio stars so far away that they appear to be at rest. This means VLBI can be said to have direct access to what is called an inertial frame. Such a frame is thought to be at rest and is therefore an ideal representation of an origin. Any kind of changing and moving objects can be related to the origin of the inertial frame. The situation for GNSS, SLR and DORIS is a little bit different as we need to have precise orbit information before one can determine location and velocity of a site on the ground. However, Easy access to GNSS signals gives the opportunity to organize a dense network of ground stations which can monitor inter- and intra-tectonic plate motion. On this map we see the velocity vectors of a multitude of space genetic stations around the globe. 
we can identify clear patterns of how stations move and assign these movements to different tectonic phenomena. We can also see that plates are not only floating but also rotating. We also see that the vectors representing the station movements reveal regional and lo local behavior even on the same plate. Note that this map shows only the horizontal movements. We can also study vertical displacements. Here we see that in particular regions the Earth's crust is actually moving upwards. For example, in Northern Europe and in Canada we see that space genetic measurements reveal land uplift rates of several millimeters per year. This phenomena can be explained by a, by a geophysical effect called post-glacial rebound. It describes rise of land masses that were covered under ice sheets during the last glacial period. When the ice sheets eventually melted away, the land literally bounced back. This means the land slowly moves upward where it was once compressed several thousand years ago. You might ask why it's important that we keep track of how fast land is rising. Well, global sea level rise is a major en environmental concern. So what happens if the crust is also rising? Assume that the sea level is rising by 2 mm per year and the crust rises with the same velocity. What would we observe at the coastline? Right, it would appear that the sea level is not changing. If post-glacial rebound is even faster, for example 4 mm per year, it would even appear that the sea level is dropping. Thus, unless we pay attention to post-glacial rebound effects and measure its velocity, there's a risk that sea level measurements aren't assessed properly. One could even find arguments that contradict evidence for global change. Thus, space genetic techniques are important measurement tools to provide changes in our environment. Thanks for watching and see you next time.